Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Brian Kiley, and I am the uh, minister, and I'm also the service leader today because all of my service leaders are either working in the RE program or out of town or up in the sound booth. So it's just me. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community, as symbolized in the banners around this room. So whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. And indeed, that's the focus of the service today. Would you please join me in the shared reading? Oh, before I introduce it, I'm going to tell you where I got it. I want to give special thanks. This whole two-month series of services is... I had a lot of help from my colleagues at Southminster Steinauer, a united church in the south side that is very liberal and uh, kind of a lot like us, only Christian. Uh, <laughs> Nancy Steves took me through. They did a similar type of eight-week event two years ago. She loaned me some of the materials and helped me keep from stumbling too badly. And this came from one of their orders of service uh, by the former moderator of the United Church of Canada. So would you please join me? We come with thanksgiving for our very breath, the warmth of sun and the sustaining waters, for life all around us, the plants, soft grasses and sheltering trees, for the ones that crawl, those that swim, and those that fly, for the four-legged and the two-legged, all our relations. We celebrate the diversity in creation as reflected in the four winds from the four directions. We especially honor the many peoples with their many gifts for understanding our shared life on the earth. We strive to live out the seven sacred teachings, respect, love, honesty, courage, humility, wisdom, truth. These teachings enable us to live in harmony with ourselves, with our neighbors, and all the created earth. I separated the sermon into three sections today. And this one is the about us part. Last Sunday, our social justice team arranged for a Kairos blanket exercise. Many of you were there. This is an embodied exercise, if you're not familiar with it, meaning that we get up and move around in a very simple kind of role play designed to help us not only think, but feel as well about the issues. The participants migrated around a carpet of blankets that were laid out on the floor, representing Canada and the whole of the First Nations peoples before contact. We experienced, after contact, our lands being taken away as women with beaver, fake beaver hats that said European on them started folding up corners of the blankets and exposing gaps. We experienced them being taken away more rapidly. I saw one of my daughters segregated into her own little blanket space because she had contracted some European disease, tuberculosis. We saw children taken to residential schools, and we saw how legislation divided communities, stripping and restricting rights of individuals. And it became a powerful path to discover some of the feelings and the histories that shape some of the First Nations communities today. Afterwards, there was a talking circle debrief. Our youth and some of the children had participated in the whole exercise, and in the talking circle as it went around, many adults chose to remark on how hopeful and inspiring it was that our young people had participated and were learning this stuff. Well, driving three of those young people home, my daughters, I asked them how it was for them. 
And responses ranged from okay to good. So I asked a little bit more. They found the talking part a little long, no surprise there. But then I learned that two of the three had already done the exercise before. And one told me, you know, we learn about the oppression of First Nations people in social studies. None of this stuff today was new to us. This is my starting point for this series of services. A critical piece of First Nations European settler contact and interaction is changing. The story is changing. The dominant culture is finally and at long last starting to learn stories that we had not heard before. I reviewed an old history book of mine from high school, Donald Crichton's Dominion of the North. It was first published in 1944, and it was still being used in high schools in the 1970s. It's about 500 pages long. Never will you find the term First Nations. He only discussed Indians and Métis, who he also called half-breeds frequently. There was no mention of Western treaties like Treaty 6. There wasn't a word on residential schools. Gift blankets poisoned with smallpox were left out. Stripping of rights did not merit any consideration at all. Even the hated Indian Act is not referenced in Crichton's work. The, the set of laws that's dominated Western, Canadian, and Indian or First Nations relations for well over a century. Indians were mostly discussed in their role as fur traders and either as allies or enemies of governments in the wars up until 1812. And there is no mention of native peoples after 1883, quote, whose existence had also been brought to a final crisis by the coming of settlement on a large scale. His message? They stopped being a player after 1883 and didn't matter anymore. This is what I learned in high school. This is probably what a good many of us learned in high school. My high school education was sadly lacking, and I loved history. Frankly, it didn't get much better in the early 1980s when I took a history degree. Though to be fair, mostly in my Canadian part of my studies, I focused on the French and Indian fur trade, and that all happened before the big land grabs when there was a viable economic partnership and some degree of recognized interdependence. But even so, as a university graduate specializing in history, I never heard the term residential schools. Not until 1986, when the, 96, when the United Church of Canada finally apologized. That's an appalling, appalling condemnation of our system of education. So my greatest takeaway from the blanket exercise was discovering that our descendants, our children, our grandchildren, are learning a very different history than we did. Their narrative contains the faults and failures of Canadian policy. Their history admits the racism and abuses. Ours did not. This encourages me. Their lessons are steps forward on the path towards truth and reconciliation. And that's what gave me hope. This path is going to be generations long. It was generations in the making. It's going to be generations long in the solution, unfortunately. But those walking the path today will have more of the story informing their actions and their decisions. And this is critical. Critical. Peruse the old narratives and you'll find no words or teachings from First Nations elders. There's no considerations of their traditions or their culture. They were suppressed. There were definite attempts to eradicate. So what was the settler's solution? To educate the Indian out of the child, to make them civilized, meaning European in education, dress, and outlook. Consider this report from Nicholas Davin, appointed by Sir John A. MacDonald, to plan the education of natives. The importance of denominational schools at the outset for Indians must be obvious. One of the earliest things is an attempt to civilize them does, 
is to take away their simple mythology, the central idea of which, to wit, a perfect spirit can hardly be improved upon. To disturb the faith without supplying a better one would be a curious process. So it became necessary to replace native spirituality with Christianity. Today, we're outraged by this. But our outrage is not the point. If the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has taught us anything, it's that it's time to stop trying to tell First Nations people what to do or what's good for them. It's time for the dominant culture to start listening to the wisdom of those, that those nations have to offer us. It is time for us to give up our failed teaching mission and start a learning mission. So let us, over the next few weeks, consider the seven sacred teachings of Native peoples. As you saw in our shared reading at the beginning of this service, there are seven major aspects to the Native spiritual teachings, seven sacred teachings that are core. And over the next few weeks, we'll be taking a bit of a look at each one of them. So the first of the sacred teachings that I wish to consider is love, represented by the eagle. You can see, if you look uh, at an image of this, it is all a circle. There's no, this isn't the necessary starting point. This is just where I chose to begin. I have a bit of a reading to begin with, written by Dave Corshane and Cindy Crow, excerpts put together. To feel true love is to know the creator. One's first love is to the great spirit. He is considered the father of all children, the giver of life enjoyed by human beings. Love expressed was shown by loving oneself and how the great spirit made you. Only then can you truly love others. If you cannot love yourself, it is impossible to love others. The eagle is the animal spirit chosen to represent this teaching of love because it is the one that could reach the highest in bringing vision to the seeker. The eagle is the most revered animal spirit in First Nations society as it is the one that flies closest to the creator. It is the one that carries the prayers of the people to the spirits. And the eagle is also an animal guide as its feathers are utilized in most, if not all, spiritual practices and ceremonies. Love is considered the greatest and most powerful medicine and healing agent, but it is very difficult to achieve and live in a world that does not acknowledge the importance of spirituality. That's the end of the reading. Well, there's a universal quality to this spiritual teaching. Love is acknowledged in every culture and every faith tradition as one of the very highest of values. The Christian missionaries arriving in Canada surely would have been aware of Paul's description of the three great gifts of God, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, he said. Sadly, that's unfortunately often translated as charity, not love. Not really the same thing at all. Love is not a a thing given. It is a quality, a state of being, an emotional structure. It is who we are and what we're feeling at a given time. Charity may be the outward expression of that state of being, but it is not love itself. Love starts with the self and it radiates outward. As the sacred teaching said, love begins with this relationship with the creator and with oneself and then it radiates outward. Love starts with connection with the divine and then it spreads. There is no limit or reservation on the quality of love coming from the creator. It's a subtle distinction we sometimes miss. Most of us have at least some training in a kind of Christian God who judges and is loving at the same time. That wasn't true in the First Nations tradition. The Creator was only loving. No judgment was implied or threatened. The God of Europeans tempered love with punishment. It could be withheld. Judgment could be given and could be very harsh and even eternal. 
Not exactly unbounded love. Not exactly unreserved affection. And so the religious teaching of love for the early settlers was tempered by all kinds of boundary-setting measures. The natives did not understand those boundaries. They only stood, understood relations that were loving and were connected. For one thing, one of the boundaries is that there was very little effort to learn from native peoples. How many of the traders and missionaries ever learned the love that was expressed by First Nations people? Instead, they chose the path of teaching our kind of limited and bounded love of natives. If you do what I want you to do, then I'm going to love you. If you don't, then I'm going to punish you. In the fur trade years, they plied their trading partners with body and soul destroying alcohol. And later, when we were taking more and more of the treaty lands, we decided it would be a smart idea to separate the children from their parents. Judging the native parents could only love their children by letting them get a civilized education. It only made sense. They would be loved the Christian way, with strict discipline and an expectation that they would become, for want of a better word, white. We in the dominant society need to learn more from the eagle. Oh, it also struck me when I was looking at this. The eagle as love. I don't know about you, but I certainly... When I think of the eagle, think of it in the American way, as a symbol of war, as the predator, as that which is always out trying to spy the next meal or protect the United States or anything like that. When the native society, yeah, that's true in the harmony of things, but it's about love. It's about carrying messages to the creator. So we in the dominant society need to learn more from the eagle, more about loving ourselves and how the creator loves us, and more about radiating that love outward with far fewer conditions than we have offered in the past. We have to relearn a new way of loving. And perhaps the eagle can be a guide for us as well, a symbol of flying free and unconstrained. Love without bounds. We could benefit from that idea. If any one quality triggered the needs for this current truth and reconciliation process, it was the idea of respect. More accurately, it was the lack of respect Europeans showed for the peoples they encountered on Turtle Island. At first, there was some measure of fairness and interdependence As indigenous people served as guides and trading partners in the fur trade, literally teaching the first courier de bois how to survive in this land. Though Jesuit missionaries did go and live among the Huron and other nations, their reaching out was paired with a passionate belief in the rightness of their Christian God and the need to carry on mission and replace native beliefs. There were attempts to integrate First Nations images and stories into Christian teachings. Jean de Brebeuf's Huron Carol at Christmas is a fine example. But there was never really, aside from individual priests, there was never really respect for those beliefs. The First Nations people were treated as children in need of civilization, education, and salvation. What was lost in that one-sided monologue was a key First Nations spiritual teaching, respect. George Martin and Cindy Crow described that teaching and its symbol in this way. No animal was more important to the existence of indigenous families than the buffalo. A single buffalo could provide food, shelter, clothing, and utensils for daily living. First Nations people were true conservationists, for they lived in a sustainable relationship with the buffalo, and they believed themselves to be the true caretakers of the great herds. The buffalo, through giving its life and sharing every part of its being, showed the deep respect it had for the people. The sustainable and mutual relationship with the buffalo resulted in a relationship that was a true expression of respect. The spirit of respect was shown toward all life, because native people saw the interconnectedness to all life. They saw very clearly their dependence on the land 
And therefore, the land and its resources were to be given absolute respect. When this respect was abused, the buffalo were hunted for fun. And therefore, we see no great buffalo herds in the wild any longer. End of quote. Mutual respect was a quality sadly lacking in the European hierarchical tradition. Respect only went one way, up the ladder of authority, towards lords, towards kings, towards gods, towards priests, bishops, popes. One knew one's place. Hence, we had the upstairs, downstairs classes of Great Britain repeated in most other European countries. Europeans believed themselves to be superior to natives all around the world, not just in North America, natives everywhere. There was nothing for them to respect. There was no need for them to learn anything from their hosts when they went voyaging to new lands. And when it came to the resources of the land, the trees, the beaver, the salmon, the buffalo, the codfish, and the like, they were wealth-generating resources to be exploited, not respected. The idea of living in harmony with the land simply did not fit into the Euro worldview. And we can see a vestigial holdover in our own Unitarian Universalist principles. I always like to try and connect so it's not just all those dead white guys that we can pretend weren't us. In our own UU principles, anybody visiting you can find them in the front of our hymn book. When the delegates first approved this statement of principles in 1984, the first principle very clearly stated, we affirm and support the worth and dignity of all persons. It's a pretty nice sentiment. It was actually a very good statement for the time, something that attacked the privilege of hierarchical systems of human interactions, except, yeah, except it did nothing to dismiss the Christian concept that God gave people dominion over the earth and its creatures. Now, I was there with the Unitarians back then, so I know there were a whole lot of people who felt that kind of respect, but it wasn't in our core documents, our core thinking. And it wasn't until a decade later, after dedicated lobbying by a lot of people, led particularly by the pagan community, the delegates finally included an additional source of wisdom, respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. Even we passionate, caring liberals had to learn about the concept of respect for the land. It's a lesson that means we need to keep learning. My theme in this series is simple. It is time for the dominant culture to stop talking and start listening. What can we learn from these wisdom teachings from a different source than our own? Some, like love, are not really new to us, although we can benefit from learning a different way to practice it and understand it and embrace it. And others, like respect, horizontal, mutual, earned respect, well, that might be a newer concept to us. It's going to take time for us to make that part of our very bones. It is a long road ahead. Amen.